evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. This is really great. It's a great turnout. And I got to tell you, uh, the Hillsdale Chamber Choir, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think they're unbelievable. <laughs> Many of them had, uh, have another concert that they had to go to, so some of them had to leave, but there are one or two stragglers in the crowd here. Tell them that I said thank you, would you please? Um, I don't know if you know this, I'm a graduate of Hillsdale College. Uh, I've vacuumed this floor many times. <laughs> um, uh, and, but when, when I can have the support of Hillsdale College behind us, uh, that really means a lot to me. And when, I, when the chamber choir sings for us, um, I don't know, it means a lot to me personally. Um, before I begin, I would like to make one very quick announcement. And that is, um, I understand that the Garmin lady, for those of you who are doing GPS uh, directions to get here, I understand that she got into an argument with some of you, and she got mad, so she sent you down Milnes Road, down a rough gravel road, uh, and finally got you here. Uh, I apologize for that. Really, uh, it's very easy to get out of here if she would have just asked me. Um, as you go out tonight, as you leave the conference center, go down Galloway Drive, turn left on Hillsdale Road, and follow it right into Jonesville. Okay? The road will take a sharp left and then a sharp right, and it'll take you right into town. You can skip the gravel road. Okay? I, on her behalf, I will apologize. Um, um, before I also begin, I wanted to make a couple of thank yous. Um, I want to thank Hillsdale College. Um, I already commented about that, but again, it really means a lot. Uh, they are offering us this facility, this entire facility, absolutely free of charge. Uh, and so, I would also especially like to thank the Enactus Group. Uh, they did all the planning for this. They did all the work for this. Uh, and uh, I think they've done a phenomenal job. I want to thank Richmond Brothers, who sponsored the event, along with CP Federal Credit Union, uh, who were sponsors for the event. I'd also like to specifically thank John Christ, who is the president of CP Federal Credit Union, for helping to orchestrate that, but I'm not supposed to tell you that he also helped to sponsor this event. That's between us. commented about the Hillsdale Chamber Choir, but they're worthy of recognizing again. Uh, I'm going to go through a few, so you don't need to clap after each one. But uh, Kira Francetic, who works for Richmond Brothers, she has helped us immeasurably in doing all of the auction stuff. Mike Murray is the advisor for the Enactus Group, and he has just turned out to be one of our closest friends and advisors. Heather Trichka. Uh, from Hillsdale is, I will call her our Hillsdale connection. Uh, she did a lot of work on our behalf and I know there are people here tonight uh, thanks to her efforts and she said she will help us next year. Um, Tina Walter, uh, she helped us to do some of the uh, design for the invitations that went out. John Brody uh, helped us to print the, uh, the invitations. Jeff Drake, my son, who is sitting over here, who is Mr. IT, uh, I'm toast without him. <laughs> Ruth Brown from uh, Hillsdale, Michigan. You're going to hear a little bit more from Ruth in a few minutes. Uh, Rico Imperial for the uh, invocation. Thank you, Rico. Rico, by the way, just got back from the Lingap Center about two weeks ago. Uh, Deb Howe. I think Deb did a fabulous job, and Deb has been an absolute workhorse in getting this whole thing uh, put together. It wouldn't have happened without Deb. So thank you, Deb. You can clap for that one. <laughs> I want to thank the Lingap Board of Directors, uh, specifically Joe Walsh, who is here with us tonight. Thank you, guys. Um, everybody who contributed to our auction, thank you. It's been kind of an exciting thing to watch. Uh, I noticed there's a few people bidding against me on a couple of things. <laughs> we'll talk. I want to thank all of you for coming. I know it's a, it was a long drive for some of you, but uh, you made it down the gravel road and everything, so thank you for that. And all of our Lingap supporters. None of this would have been possible. None of it would have been possible without you guys. But I especially want to thank 
Judy. Judy was up until 3 o'clock in the morning the other night working on things, and so this wouldn't have been possible. In fact, this whole project wouldn't have been possible without her. It wouldn't have happened without all of you. Okay, I always like to begin my presentations with a title. And so this year I'm calling it 2013. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what a year. Um, what a year. Uh, we have a lot of new people here tonight. Uh, and so uh, I am going to have to go through some of the, to give a historical perspective about how we got to where we are today. But I'm going to try to move that through that quickly so I can tell you what happened during 2013. What a year. I had another word I was going to use, but I didn't think I should. <laughs> the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines is quite a place. It's a land of unbelievable contrast. This is a picture I took in southern Cebu. It's just very quiet, very peaceful, beautiful place. Hot. Um, but it's easy going. Life is easy out there. However, it's also in the cities, it's very, very crowded, very, very noisy, very polluted, very much, very much so. Life is hard. But it's a land of incredible beauty. There are 7,011 islands in the Philippines. And uh, white sugar sand beaches, just uh, some incredible spectacular scenery. It's hot, by the way. <laughs> but there are tranquil sunsets. The sunset didn't come through on this picture very well, but in the distance there, that's the island of Negros. And there's a lot of quiet places. I love to go up here. This is on the top of a mountain. It's in an area called uh, Mulabuk. But it's also a land of stark contrast. Uh, this is the Shangri-La Mactan Hotel, um, and it is one of the premier hotel resorts in the world. It's a fabulously beautiful, beautiful place. And this is where I used to go when I was working for the company. Um, I don't know if I, I should probably mention, I used to be a senior officer with CMS Energy and Consumers Energy. Uh, and when we would buy power projects around the world, I'm the one that they would send out to, do, to figure out how we would do business there. Um, what were the labor issues like, the employee things, and so on. And when we first went to Cebu, um, we had a communist labor union representing the employees. And um, it was a very dangerous situation. They actually killed people. And so what would happen is during the week we would work very hard, but on the weekends we would go hide. And this is one of the places we used to go hide was the Shangri-La Mactan Hotel. Beautiful, beautiful place. And while I'm sitting there drinking a mint julep, uh, or something like that, I'm sure it was, um, I couldn't help but notice how spectacularly beautiful the flowers were on the concrete wall around the perimeter of the place. And curiosity finally got the best of me one day, and I walked around the wall to see what was on the other side. And there it was. This is in the shadows of the, one of the most spectacular resort hotels in the world. And here you find this crushing poverty. And it was at this point that I really began to recognize that the Philippines is a land of unbelievable contrasts. There's the ultra-rich and the unbelievably poor. There's uh, this poverty right in the shadow of unbelievable beauty and hardship. Life is hard over there. And these are some of our employees coming to work at the plant. They ride on the roof of a tricycle, get off at the plant, and I tell them they have to put on steel-toed shoes and a hard hat. And you talk about a cultural clash. There's a little bit of learning that had to take place there on both sides. But they're a resilient people. They are a very resilient people. And in spite of all this hardship, they bounce back. They always bounce back. I love this picture because there's only six people on that motorcycle. The most I've ever personally seen is seven. Uh, I do have a picture of nine because what they did is they had seven people on the motorcycle and uh, in the back they were holding buckets, they had two babies. Uh, in it. But it's a land of heartbreak as well. I took this picture in the heart of Cebu City, which is the capital of the, island, of the province of Cebu, and this little guy is sleeping on the street with his feet hanging over the curb and there are cars, trucks, and buses missing his feet by maybe six inches. And I looked at those people and I'm thinking, what's the matter with you? Don't you see this kid? Don't you see this child? How can you, what's, are you evil? 
and I pulled him out of the street. But as you think about it, I walked on down the street and about 20 yards later, there's another one laying there. And I walked on by too. And the reason is because that's the way it is. That's the way it is. These are street children. They have no place to go. And it's so common, these people probably didn't even see it. Despair. I see this lady every day. She's on an overpass in Cebu City. And this is how she makes her living. A little girl here has her uh, cup begging for money. I heard a story <clears throat> one time about a place uh, called Payatas. And this is the municipal landfill for Manila. It's uh, located in Quezon City. Another name for it is the Smoky Mountain. And the reason they call it that is because as the garbage ferments, did I mention it's hot over there? It's hot over there. And that heat in that garbage, it ferments. And so you can see how it's like this. It's always smoky up there. And I heard a story <clears throat> that I didn't believe was true that in um, July of the year 2000, there was, during the rainy season, there was a garbage slide. And they estimated that 200 people, 200 children, were buried alive. They've had estimates ranging as high as 1,000 that were buried alive. But they don't have birth certificates or records, so they don't really know. These are just guesses. But I didn't believe that was true. So one day I went out there and took a look, and this is what I found. And what happens is, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, trucks come in, big dump trucks, uh, and they're filled with garbage. And they come through the gate every five minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. And as they drive in the gate, kids will climb up on the top of the truck and start sorting through the garbage. And what they'll do is they'll toss down pieces of metal or food or anything that they can find to their friends. Uh, and then the truck starts to dump its load, and so the kids will jump off so they're not dumped out with it. And then the people below with their baskets go through the garbage picking for the food. This is how they survive. The food that they find there, they call it pug pug. Um, and they will cook it on little fires right in the dump. And the smell got into my clothes. Uh, I you couldn't get it out. It was just, it was awful. And you think, this is how these people live all the time, every day. And I found this scene. Here they are picking through the garbage. And in the distance is a Catholic chapel. Remember I said this is a land of contrasts? And here I am, I'm standing in Dante's Inferno, and I'm looking at the promise of God. It, this doesn't make sense. How can this possibly be? These are images that just burned into my head. This is, there is actually a barangay, which is a, like, a, like a township, um, inside the dump. And what will happen is the kids will, or the families will burrow into these places. That's where they live. And that's how the garbage slide happened, as they were burrowed in, into the garbage and uh, were buried. But you notice this little guy with broken glass and everything doesn't even have shoes on. Remember I talked about crushing poverty. Okay, this is the home of some of our Lingop wards. It's out in the middle of a rice paddy. This is, I was, we were in the city, now I've taken you out into the countryside. And this is a little Nipa hut, and this is where some of our kids came from. That's home. Here's the inside of one of them. This is the home of some of our kids, and that's their mother. <clears throat> you know, I, it, a lot of people say, gosh, we have poor people here in the US, so why should I help people in the Philippines? Well, you know, and I always say, it's not either or, it's and. We need to help them all, number one. But I will tell you from personal experience that our poorest people in the US are wealthy beyond these folks' wildest imagination. And it's true. It's true. I'm not even going to talk about this picture because there are young people uh, in the audience. Uh, so I'm just going to skip over it. But um, this is the most insidious one that I've got. I'll tell you about it later. So when you find these people on the street and you see this stuff happening, what do you do? What do you do about it? How do you help them? Do you give them money? No. Do not give them money. <clears throat> you know, when they come up and tap on the window of your car and go like this, don't give them money. Because what happens is the money will go to their pimps, their handlers. And if the handler knows that those kids have money and they're not giving it to them, they'll kill them. They really will. 
So you never give them money. So what do you do? How do you help them? And that was one of the things that I struggled with for a long time. Well, I don't know the answer, but here's what I do. Sometimes, I will, if there's a McDonald's or a Jollibee nearby, I will take them in and I'll buy them a quarter pounder with cheese in them and a McFlurry. And that's exactly what I did in this picture. I took these street kids. They smelled bad. Did I mention it's hot over there? Uh, yeah, they smelled bad. And they didn't speak a word of English, but they were begging. So I took them into a McDonald's. The guards weren't going to let me take them in, but I did anyway. And I gave them a quarter pounder with cheese and a McFlurry. And look at their faces. Look at their eyes. You know, I'm a human resources guy. That's what I did for the company. And you can tell a lot about a person by looking in their eyes. Okay. And I thought, good heavens, if a quarter pounder with cheese and a McFlurry will make these kids that happy, can you imagine how happy they would be if you mm, gave them an education? If you gave them a place to live, or if you just cared for them. Can you imagine? This is one of the images that I couldn't get out of my head. Well, I came home, um, and I didn't tell Judy about all this stuff. I just sort of kept it to myself. But I couldn't forget these things. And uh, so it just sort of burned into my brain for a long time. And finally, one day, CMS Energy decided we were going to sell all of our power plants around the world, including the ones in the Philippines. We didn't want to be an international energy company anymore. Uh, so John, go around the world and tell all the people that, uh, what's going to happen to them. So I did. I went back to Cebu. Now it's a non-union facility in my head. Um, but I went back to Cebu, and we wanted to say thank you to the community for allowing us to do business in their country. And so we gave them 16 computers for the school's computer system. And uh, that brought their school computer network up to a grand total of 16. <laughs> and so it was a big deal. It was a very big deal. And the mayor wanted to show me where all of these places were, you know, the computers were going to be used. So she said, would you go along with me? And I said, well, sure. But you do realize I have an airplane ticket in my hand. I'm leaving tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. I'll never forget it. And she says, that's fine, just come along. So we were riding along, and as we're riding along, we're just doing some chica chica, which is just small talk. And um, I see the Filipinos in the crowd smile. Uh, anyway, she turns around to me and she says, now you're the orphan guy, aren't you? Me? Uh, hello? You know, uh, am I the orphan guy? Well, she had obviously checked me out, and she knew I was interested in street kids and orphan kids, and that I had volunteered at an orphanage. Uh, in Bataan. So I said, well, I guess so, but why would you ask me a question like that? And she said, well, because we have a facility here in Toledo City that's in desperate need of renovation, would you be willing to renovate it and run it for us? <laughs> sure. <laughs> why not? You know? And I'm thinking, well, she clearly doesn't know I've got an airplane ticket in my pocket. And, uh, but I didn't want to be rude. Um, and so I said, well, I'll tell you what. Um, why don't you show me what we're talking about, and that way I'm buying some time and I'll come up with a good excuse. So she took me to the old Ling Up Center uh, in Toledo City, and this is a building that's about the size of a double-wide mobile home. It's a, uh, uh, it's a nasty building. And it had originally been constructed as a pig slaughterhouse. They had water supply problems, couldn't handle the, the, the pigs, so what they did is they took the pigs out and they put street children and orphan kids in to this nasty, disgusting building. Now, as awful as that sounds, you have to remember that it did save a lot of lives. There are kids alive today thanks to this horrid facility. Um, but she showed me around. This was in February of 2002. So she showed me around, and this is what I'll call the kitchen. Um, this is where the kids uh, wash the dishes, they clean the fish, they brush their teeth, they comb their hair, they take their bath. They do everything. This is the heart of the old Ling Up Center. This is the single burner hot plate where they cooked their rice. The kids did their own cooking. And so what I did is I thanked the mayor for showing me around. Um, and um, But I was thinking, I, I know of a fellow by the name of Bob Pierce who once said, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. And I have to tell you, my heart was broken. But more than that, I would say my heart was shattered. I mean, literally shattered. It's sort of 
Enough, Lord. I mean, why are you showing me this stuff? Why are you showing me these things? So I came home, and I decided, you know, I am not going to do anything like this. This is absurd. I mean, the Philippines is on the other side of the planet Earth. I'm never going back again. We've sold our plants over there. Um, I've got a big job that I love. Uh, I've got a family here. It's a different culture, different laws, different customs, different everything. I've never run an orphanage. I'm not even good with kids. And that's true. Um, ask my son, Jeff. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this was absolutely absurd. So I just decided on the way home, well, this whole thing didn't happen. So I'm just going to forget about it. And I came home and Judy said, well, John, how was your trip? And I said, oh, fine. Anything happened? No, nope, not a thing. <laughs> um, and so, but what happened was Mother Teresa said, God speaks in the silence of the heart and we listen. And what would happen is that I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would remember these faces, these little lives, these kids with no future, no hope, and no place to go. Nothing. And I would wake up crying. And she'd say, what's the matter with you? And I'd say, oh, no, I'm just having a bad dream, not a thing, I'm fine, you know. So, okay. so this went on for about a year. And finally, one morning, she said, all right, what's the matter with you? You wake up crying all the time, what's going on? Is it another woman? <laughs> she didn't actually say that. <laughs> I made that up. That's a comic relief. Um, and uh, so I told her the stories. I told her about Piatas. I told her about the kids in the street. I told her about that picture that I can't even talk about. I told her about the kids that are purposely deformed by their parents so that they can use them as begging props. I told her all of this stuff. And I said, you know, Judy, I really believe, I honestly believe that I'm being called. And I have no intention of doing something like this. It's crazy, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to be called before my maker. And he's going to ask me, he's going to say, John, I called you. Why didn't you answer? And so I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the Philippines. And I'm going to prove that it can't be done. And then I'll be home in two weeks and we'll get out of life. Said, no. And she said, okay. And so off I went to the Philippines. And um, when I got there, really, it was like with God's counsel and support that all the obstacles were overcome, everything. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Um, the kids at the Ling Up Center, at, the, at that time, children who did not have birth certificates or could not afford uniforms were not allowed to go to school. These kids weren't even in school. I went to the superintendent of schools and I said, well, should, should I do this project? Oh, absolutely. Why should I if these kids can't even go to school? And... Long story, very short, he gave us an exemption, so the Lingap kids were permitted to go to school. All right. But what about all the other millions? Well, eventually they did change the laws, so now they can go to school. The children were not welcomed in church. Why? Well, you don't want beggars in there bothering people when they're praying, now do you? Of course not. Of course not. So I had a little, I won't say what I actually said, but he and I had a very serious conversation. How's that? And um, I said, I want you to go to the Lingap Center, and once a month, I want you to do a children's mass. So, you, will you do that? Um, and he said, we'll do it better. We'll bring them into the church. And he has. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the final one, and every time these things are getting solved, I'm thinking, oh, darn, I'm losing all my excuses. You know, I don't want to do this project. Um, but I'm, I'm losing my excuses. So the last one, my, my ace in the hole, was I'm an American. I can't own land in the Philippines. So uh, I went to the mayor and I said, well, mayor, uh, you asked me to do this. So I took a very serious look at it. Uh, I can tell God that, yeah, I heard the call and I tried, but <laughs> it didn't work. Um, and uh, the last one is that I can't own land. And that old thing up center is so nasty, I would never even try to renovate it. So. Goodbye, thanks for your hospitality, I'm out of here. And she said, not so fast, we will give you the land. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And they did. And I came home and Judy says, how was your trip? Not oh, fine. <laughs> Anything happened? No. Nope. Oh, by the way, we're going to build us an orphanage in the Philippines. I said, I don't think I'm being called anymore, I think I'm on assignment. <laughs> And she said, well, that's good. How are you going to pay for it? 
well, gosh, I hadn't thought about that one, but you know, maybe we'll sell the house. What do you think? What do you think? And she said, okay. It's true. We did not have to sell the house. Everybody asked me that. All right, so what I did is I got busy raising money uh, to build a new facility. And I tried to involve the kids in this as much as I could. And here we are in 2004. That's me. Um, and the kids, I couldn't believe it. I had the blueprints for the new building. And they were just all over it. Uh, construction uh, was taking place in late 2005. Uh, this is what the interior was looking like. And then this is an artist vision. I told a, a friend of mine over there who was an artist, I said, people don't want to hear me talk. They want to see what am I actually going to try to do. So paint me a picture. Here's the blueprints. And I said, put kids in it and playground equipment because there will be kids and playground equipment. So that's what he painted. And that's what it looked like. <laughs> In March of 2006, 39 children moved into the old, into the new Link Up Center, and within a couple of weeks, we were up to our capacity of 100. This is the interior. That's the what that area I just showed you looked like. This is the boys' side. This is the girls' side, and it's got the open atrium because we can't afford air conditioning. It, it creates a flow through uh, ventilation. It works very, very well. It's really cool when it's raining really hard because you can stand inside and it's raining right by your feet. It's really cool. This is the kitchen compared to that. This is the dining room. All of the kids have been to the doctor and the dentist, all of them. And they're always relieved when it's over. <laughs> um, we've been very blessed that we have had now three Peace Corps volunteers. And it's very hard to get a Peace Corps volunteer. It's extremely hard. Uh, and actually, they're the ones that contacted us and asked us to take one. They asked us to take two. They've now asked us to take three. And we just got our third one a couple of weeks ago. And so I, sto I spoke to Ambet Yanko, uh, who is the national coordinator for the Peace Corps, and I said, why do you keep calling us? Your own policies say that you, that, that you can only have one Peace Corps volunteer every 20 years, and it's hard to get them. And he said, John, the reason why is because you are the best children's development organization in the Philippines. And I'm pretty proud of that. This is the Link Up Center. <laughs> This is the Ling Up Center staff. Uh, we have uh, 21 full-time and four part-time employees. Um, can anybody see me in that picture? <laughs> <laughs> that is right there. Missed that. Um, since we opened the new Ling Up Center uh, in 2006, uh, we have sponsored for baptism 102 children uh, into the church. Oops. Um, they say the rosary every night at 6 o'clock. They do it on their knees on a hard tile floor. And the thing that's amazing about that to me is that when they're praying the rosary, they mean, they mean it. They aren't going through the motions. They are, they mean it. Wouldn't you agree, Rico and Gina? They mean it. We are the official church choir. Now, think about this. Think about this. These are kids who are not even permitted inside the church just a couple of years ago, and now we are the official choir. And I have to tell you, chamber choir, you guys are good, but these kids, <laughs> they're good. <laughs> but we, uh, we get asked to sing at weddings, fiestas, funerals. In fact, it's at the point where we turn down many offers because uh, we just get so many. Uh, they can't do it. They can't keep up. We do have a new choir director who works with us periodically, and we're hoping to make a, a CD at some point in time. Um, one of the things we did when we built the center is we had to fill it. It was a rice paddy, so we had to raise it up about five feet. And so what they did is they just brought in rocks. And we had a pile of rocks for a long time. And somebody said, well, why don't you make it a garden? So we found somebody that donated 60 huge dump trucks, not pickup trucks, but huge dump trucks, load, loads of dirt, and they dumped it into a mountain right in the middle. And we said, there you go, kids, have a good time. And they got busy, and they leveled the place, 
This is Rona Eladora. She was the garden captain, and she is now in her third, no, fourth year uh, at um, Cebu Institute of Technology, majoring in agriculture. She did an internship in the Netherlands uh, last year. And uh, this is our garden. Eggplant. You like eggplant? <laughs> We grow eggplant, tomatoes, some sort of squash and eggplant. And then there's a section with eggplant. <laughs> and this area here uh, is at the back. That's a little nipa hut. It's called a payat. And what I like about that, it's very, very peaceful out there. Now remember the children that we have are all victims of abuse, neglect, exploitation. Their lives are right out of the manuals. I mean, their lives are terrible. And so when kids are having any issues with each other or, you know, any other kinds of issues, the social workers can take them out in the pie. It's very peaceful and very quiet out there. Um, I love it out there. We started in 2008 a street children's education program. We, um, you know, we've got all of our kids, our 100 kids, and they're doing pretty good now. But what about all those other kids that don't make it into the Lingap Center? So I hired Janice here, who is a street educator, and she is phenomenal. She goes out and works with the kids, and she teaches them reading, arithmetic, basic arithmetic, hygiene, and values. And on Fridays, we take them to the church for catechism classes. And see, what they do is they put their lessons up on a tree, uh, and once they finish their lessons and turn it in, then we feed them a lunch. And some of the kids will eat it on the spot, and some will take it home to feed their entire family. And here they are eating their lunch. And these are some of our street students. Now what's really interesting is some of these kids are coming back as they're growing up and are being like teacher's aides. And they're learning the most because they have to know more to help with the kids. So it's sort of like throwing a pebble into the water and the ripples are starting to grow. This is fun. I love doing this stuff. Here's some of our street kids. And Mother Teresa once said, being unwanted, unloved, forgotten by everybody, I think that's a much greater hunger, a much greater poverty than the person who has nothing to eat. And I would absolutely agree with her. Here's Richard. Richard we found in the street education program. He was a street beggar, had been severely beaten and abused, terribly beaten and abused. We brought him into the center and we put him in school. And here he is. He's a church uh, altar server. Wasn't permitted in before. Some of our 2013 high school graduates, we had a whole bunch of them last year. This year we have 15 in college. 15 kids who were not permitted in school are now in college thanks to you. You are the ones who made that possible. Remember this picture? This is Margie Ladamo. That's where I started Margie, receiving her bachelor's degree. She's now working as a cook at the Marriott Hotel in Cebu City. Her lifelong dream was to become a chef. She's on her way. What a great kid. This is Marmi Pantila. That's Marmi <laughs> Getting her bachelor's degree. Did I mention that I'm pretty proud of these kids? <laughs> She's working at the Marriott Hotel. Just happens that I'm friends with the general manager. <laughs> um, but she is going to uh, soon be transferring into their events planning department. This is Eileen Bantolinao and her brother Edmar. And that's Eileen. She graduated uh, with a degree in October. And she has won a uh, year-long internship at the Baltimore Country Club beginning on April 1st. Um, I had really hoped that she would be able to be here tonight to speak to us. Um, but she couldn't, uh, they, she didn't, her visa didn't allow her to come early. Um, but she is one heck of a great kid. In January of 2011, we were doing a home visit, and with me that day was Judy um, and uh, Dr. Jay Burnett, who is on our board from Atlanta. And we came across a nasty old Nipah. Uh, this is the home of two of our uh, kids, 
And in this Nipah hut, we found this little baby. She was almost dead. And Dr. Brunette, you see the water bottle here? We tried to give her water, but she was so weak that the water just ran out of her mouth. She couldn't even drink it. We turned around and we found her twin sister. And um, uh, we called the police and the Department of Social Welfare and Development, and we said, you know, we found these kids. They're dying. Will you please come and help us? We can't, you know, I couldn't take them because that would be kidnapping. So they came out, they looked at him, and they said, well, these kids are going to be dead in three days. I said, that's right. Let's do something about it. And they said, well, we don't have the money for medicine. We don't have the money for burial expenses. So, John, walk away. Just walk away, leave them. I said, you're kidding. Are you serious? And they said, walk away, they're going to last. So what we did instead is we took them and we put them in the hospital. They were in the hospital for about five months. They had pneumonia, um, tuberculosis, worms, lice, body sores. Um, I don't know, they, if, they, if, if there's a name, they had it. Uh, and they were in the hospital for five months. These are the twins right here. There they are. September of 2011, December of 2012, 2013. <laughs> Here they are on their way to preschool. There they are graduating from preschool. picture was taken Thursday. So this is fresh off the press. But the one point that I want to make here is you clap for me. Don't clap for me. It wasn't me. The ones, these kids are alive today because of you. Because of you. If not for you, we would not have been there. We would not have gone. I couldn't have done this project without the support of all of you. So the ones who deserve the applause are you. Okay, remember I said the parish priest uh, agreed to come out to the Lingap Center once a month and do a children's mass. And I said, if you will do that, what I will do in return is I will feed any child who comes. Okay? So you come out and do mass, I'll feed everybody who comes. So, here we go. <clears throat> the role that if he would come and do a mass on the third Saturday of every month, what I would do is I would open up the facility to any of the poor children in the community. And so I would basically all open up to any kid who wants to attend. And during normal months, we'll have 400, 600 kids show up for Mass. And, uh, and then we feed them all. We're having a, a program today. And we're anticipating over 4,000 children. <laughs> Twenty-six kids is where I started, and now I reach, we're touching thousands of kids. Um, the various barangays around, a barangay is somewhat like a township, um, they're watching what we're doing, and they're thinking, it, maybe we should be doing this. And so they started their own third Thursday program, or something like this, and so even though we may not be the ones touching their lives, they're following our model. So their place follows the leader. It doesn't get any better than that. Uh, that place where I was sitting is the Pai Pai, which I showed you earlier. It's a cool place. 
Um, <clears throat> Father Jeff Rose, right here, is a very close friend of ours. He is a, the official Lingop Center chaplain, and he goes with us over there quite a bit. And every time he goes with me, we go out to the squatter villages, and he celebrates Mass. And from a spiritual perspective, this is probably one of the most spiritual things that I've ever experienced because these people are the disenfranchised. And I've got a good story I'm going to tell you. Um, they don't go to church because they don't feel like they're welcome, and they're not. In fact, this one area, this is Larat, and this area is noted as being uh, a den of thieves and um, evildoers. That's exactly what they are. You just don't want to go down there. It's, it's a very dangerous place. And so Father Jeff and I go out there uh, and we'll celebrate Mass. In one case, uh, the lady, after we celebrated Mass, a lady asked us to have dinner at her house. Well, I gotta tell you, um, uh, thank you, uh, oh, just terribly full. Uh, mm, but we couldn't get out of it. And she gave us roast chicken, warm Coke, and rice. And uh, she just, we said, well, please join us. And she refused to join us because she said, no, 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 uh, my honor to serve you. She had never, she couldn't believe that a priest and somebody as well known as me in the community would actually come to her home and celebrate mass and then eat a meal with them. And she just stood there and cried. And so did I. Um, but it was a very, very moving experience. But what has happened since then is these people, we, Father Jeff did a retreat at the church over there. I mean, we've done this a number of times. And so um, what happened is the people in this little community feel as though because the Lingup Center is reaching out to them uh, and because we're doing these things that, that somehow they're being called by God to change their evil ways. And so what they did is they pooled what little money they had and they built a chapel built the chapel. It's, un it's unbelievable. Okay, the Lingot Bakery and Commercial Cooking Class. We hired a cook from uh, the, some of the resort hotels to come uh, and cook for the kids. And I bought him a brand new, uh, very expensive oven. And so he set up a commercial cooking class and he teaches them to, uh, to bake. We got them little white chef uniforms, they love it. Um, and they, they set up a little business, and they're selling um, um, all sorts of breads and cookies and cakes uh, to the community. They take orders, and so they had to organize a business. They have a president, they've got a treasurer, they've got a marketing representative, and they do all of the cooking. And now they can't, they're having trouble keeping up with their orders, um, <laughs> but they're working at it. And what we do with the money is, it's a three-way split. A third of the money goes to help us pay for the cost of the oven. A third of the money goes back to the Lingup Center as a, like a sustainability project. And a third of the money gets put into our own co-op. So they're saving the money as a nest egg for when they ultimately leave the Lingup Center. They do wedding cakes. And the boys do this. And Nettie Javier, I'm sorry, I mean, you're good. But <laughs> we got some work to do. <laughs> Here's some of the things that they take and sell at the stores and the Sari Sari stores. Um, this is the good news portion. 2013 was a good year. We were rated for the second time as a top rated nonprofit by great nonprofits. Uh, you all could help me with that if you would by just doing, posting a rating. Go to our website and uh, rate us. This gets us a lot of money um, in that people look at these reviews and see that other people think we're doing a good job and they will donate. I've had people donate significant amounts of money to us based solely on these reviews. So I would like to ask you, please, please feel free to rate it. It takes about three minutes and it costs nothing. Huffington Post named us the top rated international children's charity in January of 2014. CNN uh, got word of this, and they have done a feature story on us. It's not going to be on television, but it's going to be on their international online news. Um, I don't, it's all done. I don't know when it's going to uh, be posted. We will send out some sort of an email blast and Facebook blast 
uh, once it is, but this could be very big for us because once we get picked up at that level, you know, who knows what I may actually have to hire somebody. <laughs> but then the bad began with a vengeance. And I looked it right in the eye. <laughs> um, the water in Cebu is very caustic, very, very caustic, and it eats the pipes. And we started having water supply problems. And then all of a sudden, uh, in the early summer, last summer, uh, everything stopped. The temperature was about 110, uh, and we had no water, and 100 little kids. We had no water for three months. Now think about that. With a hundred little kids, for three months we had no water. Well, the building is a concrete building, and of course all the plumbing pipes are embedded in the concrete. And so they had to plow through all of that, and they had to replace every single pipe in the entire campus. It was a mess. And to try to prevent this from happening in the future, we had to put in a brand new uh, water filtering system. It's a pretty exotic system, uh, but it seems to be working pretty well. These are some of the tanks. And 15,000 unbudgeted dollars later, we experienced the uh, 7.2 magnitude earthquake that hit Bohol. Thank God. We had no injuries and no damage. We got through it very, very well. But the kids told me, and I don't understand how this works, it's a concrete building, and they said it was going just like waves on an ocean, and they said they were terrified. In fact, when they compared it to Typhoon Yolanda, they said the earthquake was worse. It's hard to imagine. But then, just what this was, this was October 15th. Here it is, November 8th. Remember I showed you the chicken? He was angry. Typhoon Yolanda came along. Now, I started following this when I first got word of it. I started following it on the internet uh, to see what the track of it was going to be. And all of the models showed it going directly across Cebu. In fact, the line that they showed literally went right across Toledo City. I knew we were in big trouble. This was the biggest typhoon ever in recorded history. And it hit the island on November 8th of 2013. As you know, it wiped out Tacloban. Uh, and then it moved and it started to curve a little bit to the north and it hit northern Cebu and then across to, to some of the other islands. And I started getting uh, email messages from the center, from Jojen, the Lingat manager, and she was sending me, the wind is blowing very hard, it's getting very dark. It happened during the day, uh, our time, early in the morning. And she said, it's getting very dark. People are evacuating into the Lingap Center because it's a concrete building. We're the most substantial structure around. And so I said, well, bring them in, bring them in. And uh, then it went dead. And then I started getting text messages. Um, we've lost our power. You know, the kids are praying. Mm. The kids are praying the rosary as fast as they can. And then it went dead. Totally dead. And I thought, it's all over. I was watching on the internet and you could see it moving through and it was over. It was a long night. And then at eight o'clock in the morning, our time, which would have been eight o'clock at night over there, I got a note from Joe in an email, which meant the electricity was on, that said, the sun is shining. Sorry. We had no damage at all. No one was hurt. Nothing. God was certainly smiling on us that day. He really was. I started being deluged with telephone calls, email messages, text messages, people saying, how are the kids? How are the kids? How are they? Hundreds of them. And so finally I said, Jojen, please put something out there that's saying they're okay. So they posted this on Facebook saying, we are okay. Thank you for your prayers. But the kids were pretty upset about this. Uh, and so I went over there the next day. And uh, what we did is we prepared 1,200 relief packages. Uh, these are the kids putting it all together. Uh, the, the commercial cooking class baked 1,200 loaves of bread. 
minus one or two, which I ate. That's <laughs> because it's really good. Um, but they were baking bread and they were preparing these uh, relief packages. And uh, at six o'clock in the morning, we, uh, we got a truck and our van and another van and we loaded everything up and we headed to Northern Cebu. And um, along the way, we started seeing signs like this. Uh, we need food and water. We have no food. And, you know, here we'll see a tornado that will go through and you'll think, boy, this was bad in this area. And then a mile later, it's like nothing happened. Over there, this went on for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. I didn't see a chainsaw anywhere, but there were trees on houses, on schools. There were schools that were just gone. And so what we did is we went out to an area because we thought we might be stampeded. Uh, and so we went out to sort of a, or a, an area that was open, and the people started coming. They started lining up, and the lines just started getting longer. And these are the kids handing out the packages, uh, the relief packages. Um, this means a lot. It's from the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 9, which says, Let us not become weary of doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Well, that night, as we were driving back from this, oh, I have to tell you one more story. We, we came across a lady who was laying by the road. She was crippled. She was an elderly lady. And we stopped and I got out. And I'm giving her water. And she's laying in the hot sun. It had been for days. And she's saying, oh, bless you, God, thank God. All she wanted was a drink of water. And I'm down here and I'm thinking, what in the world am I doing here in the midst of Typhoon Yolanda giving this lady a drink of water with a whole bunch of orphan kids. I'm not the one that should see this. The one that should see it are you. Because if not for you, we would not have been there. We wouldn't have been. You are the ones, you were there. You were there and that woman is alive today because we did those relief missions. So I told the kids as we were going back, I said, they were, when we were going up there, they were singing, you know, 100 bottles of beer on the wall or something like that. <laughs> and uh, when we got up there, you know, they saw this, it was very emotional. It really was probably one of the emotional experiences of my entire life. And I said, um, okay, kids, when we get back, we didn't take all of them, we only took about a third. And I said, when we get back, I want you to tell everybody who didn't go what you saw, what you experienced, and how it felt. And that night before we prayed the rosary, they got up one at a time and told their story. Some talked for a long time. Some kids were so choked up they couldn't talk. And after that was over, that night I was in my room and three of them came to see me and they said, Tito, we know what we want to be when we grow up. And I said, what, what would that be? And they said, we want to grow up and be just like you. And they meant just like you, because my philosophy is that helping others is the greatest gift that you can give to yourself. And these kids learned that lesson. They want to be able to give just like you. So for all of you, thank you for that. So I'm going to come right out and say, typically I don't like to be really forward and ask for help, but I'm going to this time. We need your help. I really do. I need your help. This thing is growing. Uh, we're growing by leaps and bounds. You've seen the pictures. Things that you could, well, that have happened. I told you about the entire plumbing system needing to be replaced. Well, I don't know. That was something. My budget for 2014 is $320,000. You see what we do with it, the street program, the third Saturday outreach, you know, this is what we do with it. So every year, to keep that place going, I have to raise $320,000. At the same time I'm trying to do that, my board wants me to raise an endowment fund. Because, sadly, I'm starting to get to be on the darker side of life. And uh, they're being concerned about sustainability. What happens if something happens to me and I'm no longer able to go out and raise money? So we need an endowment. So I'm, at the same time I'm raising operating money, I'm also trying to raise an endowment. 
to keep us going. All of our funding comes from donations and from sponsorships, the place at the table sponsorships. That's what I really rely on. Currently, I have just about exactly one half of the number of recurring sponsorships that I need to keep this going. So about $160,000 a year comes in. That means I don't have to go out and try to find new ways to raise it. It comes in automatically. But the rest I get from giving talks in churches or to anybody that will listen. But there's about 200 people here tonight. There's about 200 of you here tonight. A place at the table sponsorship is $25 a month. Um, there are some who do multiples of that. But my thought was, is that if everybody here, if 200 people did $25 a month, that equals $5,000 a month, or $60,000 a year. That would go a very long ways uh, towards uh, helping. So I'm, you will get, as you leave, if you haven't already, one of these brochures. And there is a uh, place at the table enrollment form in it, uh, if you would be interested. But please consider a sponsorship. Tell your friends about us. As I said, I'll talk to anybody that listens as long as there's at least one person in the crowd, otherwise I'm talking to myself. Um, do a great nonprofits review. I talked about that earlier. It doesn't cost a thing and it really helps us a lot. Participate in the auction. Um, I think we have a pretty cool auction this year. It was kind of fun. If you see something you want, go out and try to get it. I know the one is finished already, but the online auction is still going until tomorrow night. Everything is tax deductible. We are a 501c3 organization, so it is tax deductible. And because I believe in this project so much, and the board of directors believes in it so much, between the board and myself, we pay for all of the administrative expenses so that 100% of every donation we receive, 100%, goes directly to the kids. And just remember, not any of this, none of this would have been possible without you. That's my story. Video 